Hello there, my friends, and welcome back to TNO with the USA under Robert Francis Kennedy. It is currently July 28th. Oh, July 28th, 1967. Great, it's my birthday. Even though I wasn't born uh, or alive during that time, regardless. Uh, let's do our next focus. Right now, we're really trying to push to get back the ports of LA and San Francisco and maybe even Hawaii. So we're going to go beeline down this path as fast as possible because... After the next election, we might not be able to do so. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Let's do Fort Alcatraz. The port garrisons themselves should be a little more than slight speed bumps for our tanks. But our generals are worried about the Japanese Navy elements present in many of the ports. With the port so close to important civilian, residential, and financial areas, an open naval battle in the harbors, or God forbid, open shelling of the cities, would be disastrous. Let us install heavy metal, or heavy, well, heavy metal would be kind of cool, but heavy naval artillery on islands and shorelines surrounding the ports, with minimal effort to hide it from the Japanese. With some luck, they'll be too frightened to leave port when fighting when the fighting starts. And even if they do try to run the gauntlet, we will neutralize them before we, they can get close to a good firing position. So, uh, some people thought that I might be trying to go to war with uh, Japan. I might be, maybe. We'll see what happens. Right now, we've got to get some uh, ships done here, too. Cool. I guess i got to stop saying, um. Because I was working a little bit more on our naval stuff. I have going to put a lot of ships here just in case, right now. Just so that we can get everyone over here as fast as possible. Uh, let's see. Yeah, because we don't need to do the Caribbean anymore. Or the Maria Plain, so. I forget which one I used for this group. There we go. Cool. Just because that's when we went to war with Guiana, and I forgot I was still using them. Go figure. An economy department? Very nice. Passive defense? Very good. A couple comments from yesterday. Someone said, how do you get back Hawaii? Well, I'll be honest, I had never gone back Hawaii when I played the United States. I've only played them once. So, we'll do the best we can. I'll try to get Hawaii, so. Apparently you can, like, trade Panama for Hawaii, but we'll see what happens. Battleship Diplomacy. Any battle with, J with Japan, whether it be with guns blazing or the threat of said guns, we will be decided by our naval capability. We will need an overwhelming force to threaten the scum out of their brutalized domains on American soil, from Honolulu to the Atu Island. We need more dockyards, better dockyards, faster dockyards. Show the Jap the unrivaled power of thousands of tons of American steel. Which would be a good thing to do. Uh, let's see... And also, we have a little bit... We are less than 90 billion in terms of debt, which is great. Our GDP is almost 500 billion. We're going to do that. I'm going to try to keep saving up more political power because, well, we got stuff over here. And the war on pacifism, I'm actually going to do that one. Ooh, 42 days, you get 10% more political power. And you get more war support. I think I want to get a little bit more war support. I don't mind spending a little bit on that. Someone recommended it in the comments from yesterday. It, says, it looks like we might go to war with Japan, which I hope we don't, but we might. Mr. Mocha Lover... Research more naval doctrine, because if you don't, you're going to get decimated. And France sides with Italy. Almost, move most of the Usually on almost every game, at least in a lot of the games I play, the French state actually goes with Germany, but cool, whatever. Now we get 1.09, which is actually kind of nice. Obviously, it costs us more political power, but we do get more weekly war support for like 5% more war support, which is, you know, it's okay. Not great, but not bad. Uh, let's see how this looking. That's good. Research is looking good. That's looking good as well. And there we go. Good. Even though I should, probably shouldn't be slashing the budget right now, but that's okay. We do have uh, the ports guarded right now. Even though it looks like the Japanese are also down there. How strong are they? Dai Shidan. They're probably pretty well entrenched. I'm going to assume 20 combat width with 10 infantry battalions each. See all, hear all. Our computers and cryptographers have done it at last. We now have a complete understanding of how many and what Japanese troops move in and out of their... Um, <clears throat> our ports, and where they are stationed. We also get advance warning of any sudden Japanese naval reinforcements. We are ready as we can get once we rep once we redeploy our troops after these plans. Get more forts, and some more political power, which would be nice. Cool. I keep could keep doing this stuff, like easing southern fears. At this point, we're not trying to push for more liberalism here, or, you know, trying to be doing more justice-oriented stuff, because I'm really focusing on foreign policy, which actually kind of makes RFK run actually really kind of good. So then if we were to re-elect RFK, we could probably focus more on healthcare and stuff like that, but that's not what we're doing right now. We could do this. We're going to get... We're going to wait to do that. Let's start doing some naval doctrine. Naval hit chance. Wait, plus 10%. Kantai Kessen. Undersea coordinates. Eh, that's not bad. Destroyers. That's not bad. Greenwater Navy. We can't do that. Uh, but heavy missile ship focus. Ooh. Battleship and cruiser organization. Capital ship attack. Carrier organization. I like that. Plus speed. Global fleet distribution. Reveal chance, not bad. Refitting cost, ooh, that's 10%. But if we don't refit, it doesn't mean anything. Ships repair faster, which is awesome. Carrier organization and sortie efficiency. Oh, we get 10 and 10%, huh? 
and frigate organization, screen attack, fleet coordination, carrier organization, or, oh yeah, we'll definitely go with that one, Bastions of the Sea, do we want, what is that one, Decisive Battle Doctrine, uh, is a strategy of eliminating the enemy navy in a quick and decisive battle, which the IJN used successfully in the last war, cool, naval hit chance, that's not bad, you get more naval XP, but that doesn't really mean anything to me, naval max range factor, uh, we got one, two, well, they're pretty much the same number. Destroy organization. Screen defense is not bad. Plus 15% defense. And you do get more battleship organization and cruiser, but we really don't have that many battleships compared to carriers. So I'm going to go ahead and choose this one. Global fleet distribution, just because this makes probably the most sense. We don't want to use the Japanese doctrine, even though it was pretty useful for them. Uh, yeah, this would be better to do overall. Hey, over half a trillion in GDP. Oh, I love America. And we're still building some radars and stuff like that, too. All right, cool. With this, let's go and do the air doctrine, because we will need planes if we do go to war. Uh, let's do mission specialities. Very good. Less air fuel consumption, which is fine. More efficiency. And experience gain. Not bad. Not bad. Even though we already have quite a bit. Fight for the schools. We're okay for now. Uh, international CIA operations. Hardline supporters. No. Mm -hmm. I don't mind dividing... The NPP right now. I really don't. Fight for the schools. More liberal. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Campaign for civil rights. I don't mind. Maybe maybe we could do campaign for civil rights. And then East Southern Fears. Actually, does East Southern Fears... Uh, it grows a little more unified, so we can't do that. Okay, see all here all. Now we should do on to Tokyo. The Japanese may be imperialist, but brutal devils who have gripped Hawaii and our West Coast ports and their claws for some 20-odd years, but we still give them a chance at negotiating before we wipe the floor with them. Their intercontinental ballistic missiles are in range of most American states, and many at the Pentagon and White House are worried that, we, that should the conflict escalate into nuclear exchange, it could prove costly. Even if the Japanese missiles are inferior copies of America's and to lesser extent Germany's quality designs, some of them um, might actually hit close to the targets with atomic weapon accuracy is not the biggest concern. A peaceful withdrawal of the Japanese garrisons would soothe our righteous wrath, and for a little while, anyway. Demand a meeting with them. Nothing can stop us now. Go straight on in. Political landscape. Uh, yep, yeah, NPP is really ready for anything. Uh, we don't do this. 0.99. That's not bad. I'm going to continue sp keep spending more money here. Just because we got to get even that minuscule, that much more political power every day by doing that. We get 0.86. Hmm. Cool. And we're building some, at least one more civilian factory. We're finally building in... North Dakota, which makes them probably a little happier. But we're also building up a lot of radar. Actually, all on the East Coast. Uh, well, at least we got Was some radar up here in Washington. That's kind of nice. California. Uh, I'm going to do California first, just because they're most likely uh, susceptible to being hit. Wow, let's get Mary Jackson. I like Jane Boole, but Mary? What do you know about Mary? Cool. More passive defense. You never know. NKVD. Oh. Magna Togorsk. Declare War in Orenburg. Someone wants me to play as that country too as well. Russia. Well. Oh, let's become a... Oh, oh wait. I, maybe I should not have clicked on that. I need to save political power. God dang it. Oh, no. Not Delvanga. No. I love Delvanga. Delvanga. Delvanga? Delvanga. I don't know. Uh, well, anyone who says they love Delvanga is like... Mm, I don't know, man. Kind of crazy. Kind of nuts. Good. Keep cutting that budget down because where we're going... Cool. Uh, yeah. We're going to need a, a lot of things. We're going to need a lot of fuel. Hopefully to trade. For a couple things here and there. Go and do that. Yeah. Plenty of carriers. Yeah, apparently someone said, actually on my Discord server, it was one of my mods, he told me that the Japanese have a bigger fleet than you, Mr. Mocha Lover. I'm like, you're probably not wrong. <laughs> so I'm going to make sure we have all of our ships around here just to be ready, just in case. And just in case, we can do the OF and a little more unified down under... Let's do down under. Some of our most important allies come from a down, land down under, where the women glow and the men plunder. The Australians produce more than just kangaroos and big knives. They also make for our fierce soldiers, as shown in both world wars. Let us help review our plans for helping them out. Because I still have to make sure that we go down the path here. I'm pretty sure it's down here with un-American institutions to examine the police force and do stuff like this. And, uh... Commit actions that will make people really, really unhappy with RFK. 
All right, my friends, the treaty port negotiations, the assembled cabinet was silent, digesting the contents of the proposals before them. President Kennedy surveyed the room, knowing the enormity of the moment was giving everyone pause. It's been 20 years, two decades, since the end of the war, gentlemen, President Kennedy said. A decade ago, since Eisenhower tore up the Akagi Accords and admitted Hawaii to the Union. Now it's our turn to finish what he started. The proposals to stand up to Japan at last, to demand negotiations over the treaty ports of San Francisco and L.A., would be the most ambitious and consequential diplomatic initiative by the U.S. in their lifetime. The eyes of the world and of the American electorate would be scrutinized them under a microscope. There would be no room for failure. The Japanese wouldn't simply fold, but it was clear that holding ports halfway across the world, a diplomatic nightmare and impossible to secure, was increasingly unattractive. How much could America push without being pushed aside by Japan in return? It would take the political power of the American government to ensure the successful return of the ports without giving away the house to the Japanese in the process. But a few concessions here and there might be useful in making demands further down the line. Let's make history, gentlemen. New decisions category for the Honolulu Accords. A political power pool that gains or loses political power depending on how much we invest. Both Japan and America want to use the system. Whichever superpower invests more political power will gain all political power from the pool at the end of the clause. Cool. Alright, we got the political landscape, which I don't care about because it's not an election year. And the Honolulu Accords. In 1960, Eisenhower tore up the Kagi Accords and resumed a total embargo against the Japanese Empire, leading to a tense international standoff between them, which re resulted in the Hawaiian Missile Crisis. Cool. Uh, the outcomes of the talks will be determined by the political efforts both sides invest into gaining the upper hand and the negotiations, and the talks could go very interesting directions should the negotiators think outside the box. We're currently discussing the location for the meeting. Uh, nobody's in the lead. How do I invest some PP into there? Expand recruitment drives? Weekly manpower? Arm XP? Eh, that stuff is okay. We could rally other parts of our party, but I don't really care. This is all okay, but whatever, you know. Um, hopefully this will pop up soon, because I played this before, and I tried this before, and I actually got the ports back, I think. But, it's, when I played this before, it was a little bugged. Okay, so what the heck? Um, is there, like, a modifier here we can choose? And this is a Senate. Leader of the Free World. Uh, How do I... Oh, no, let's see, let's see. Decrease black market trading, increase party unity, campaign for walls, civil rights. Himmler, research. We don't have any way to invest more political power. The Japanese propose a summit location. President RFK and the Secretary of State read through the diplomatic message that had arrived from the Japanese embassy again. They want to meet on one of the carriers in San Francisco Bay, huh? President Kennedy laughed scornfully. I thought we did that already on the Akagi. At least it's close to home. We'll have an easier time getting secure messages to and from Washington if we're in San Francisco anyway. The Secretary of State mooled over the note's contents. Though we can't rule out the risk of bugs in the carrier, and I'm not sure the Japanese will take kindly to a suggestion that we sweep their ship. Hmm, Mr. President Kennedy nodded. We'd still be doing them a favor, meeting them on the ship like this. Any other options? Well, we could suggest they come to one of our carriers. The voters will love the imagery. The Secretary of State replied, though I'm sure the Japanese, or Japan's Prime Minister would be having the same concerns we have. The two fell silent for a second. Maybe we should just ask him if they would be alright with Mexico City. Carrier. We lose political power, thus investing more. Americans have a counteroffer. Propose Mexico City. We'll talk on, the, on their carrier. We will gain by losing some of our invested political power. Uh... We will lose political power, but then we invest more. Hmm. You know what? Let's just do Mexico City as a neutral ground. You know what? I think that's pretty good. Keep paying that off for now. That'd be fine. Cool. Let's grab anti guerrilla activities because we can. So, the summit is set. The Japanese have just sent over the agreement on the location. We're good to go for the summit. A momentary look of relief emerged on the Secretary of State's face before swiftly disappearing. Now comes the hard part, President RFK said. We'd better get ready for what the Japanese are going to want in exchange for giving our territory back. They want our oil and they want access to our markets. The Secretary of State slid a folder on the President's desk. With everything that's been going on in their sphere, I can't say I blame them. President Kennedy smiled at le and that gives us leverage. They demand oil. So, I'll be honest. Oh look, they have no political power invested. The thing is, if this goes wrong, because I want to get our ports back at least. Maybe Hawaii? If this goes poorly, I'm well, I will save scum a little bit just so that we can do okay. Japanese and Mayan oil. Mr. President, we've started our negotiations with the Empire of Japan about the potential reacquisition of our California ports. One big problem between our nations and the co-prosperity sphere is the fact that we do not trade enough. Because of this, the Japanese have demanded substantial amounts of oil to make up for the most recent shortages. Simply put, the sphere lacks many oil reserves that we have here in the U.S. Luckily, the Japanese diplomats seem pretty desperate to sign a contract with us. If we grant them subsidized oil purchases, the economy of the sphere will continue functioning and we may regain our lost ports. If we help out the Japanese in the sphere... Uh, they may help us out, too. And we could see a brighter relationship between our two nations. We could also have a chance of bringing American workers back to work for us. 
Now, the question at the moment is, how much will, uh, oil will we give to the Empire of Japan? We could be generous and offer them the substantial amounts of oil they say they need. We could go down the middle and offer them a moderate amount of oil. Finally, we could give them a small amount of oil, but they may not accept the offer. We need to consider what the Japanese plan to use for the oil for. What do you say, Mr. President? Give them minimal, give them enough. We're going to give them all as much as we possibly can give them. Just because, look, if they want to, you know, destroy other people, I like Jane, but let's, I already have, we already have two Marys. We have one Mary, but now we're going to, Matkins? I'll just go with Robertson. Uh, oh, the Divine Mandate's still here, cool. But, you know what, if you want to use this against China, go right ahead. Go right ahead. U.S. Japanese talks begin, can the Pacific live up to its name? A complete success. The trade deal between the U.S. and the Empire of Japan is being finalized after days of proposal and communication. It seems like both parties are getting the resources they need. The U.S. will have its ports in San Francisco and L.A. return without conflict, and the Empire of Japan will be given an oil grant that will help them solve the widespread shortage throughout the sphere. The President and Prime Minister of the U.S. and Japan, respectively, shook hands on the deal just moments ago. No matter what, both parties hope that these negotiations will better relations between the two global superpowers. Workers in both California and the Japanese home islands rejoice as the nations announce the completion of the deal. Though the trade deal was completed, the diplomats of the U.S. and Japan still have work to do. Talks are supposed to carry on into the next few days, but one thing is for sure, there will be a peaceful end to these important negotiations. The negotiations worked. Oh, they're still here though for now. That's fine. I, I need to do on American institutions, but it's only November. We can wait a little bit. The, do Ooh. the docks of Darwin. The factories of Sydney. I kind of like this. I like Fortress Australia. Let's do the OFN first, though. We will have 125 million expenses. And, uh, the, oh, okay, so we get a more unified. And everyone in our, in our faction gets one off map to the land factory. That's kind of cool. The RDs may be hesitant about sharing the industrial bounty of America with its allies. But we know better. A stronger alliance means a stronger America, and so we must promptly strike up deals with our allies where we give them foreign aid in exchange for using them to buy American arms and equipment. All right, Japan, what else do you want? Down, under? Oh, no, foreign men, you're going to want to see this. The shift foreman raced out from the mining office as the miners rushed out of the mines, racing towards the entrance to the complex. The ground rumbled faintly as the newest American excavator lumbered into sight. Sitting well over the height of three men and belching diesel smoke from its exhaust, the mighty machine crawled over the pitted rocks of the path leading to the Mount Issa mines and the Queen's Line outback. The miner who had pulled the foreman outside could barely hide his excitement. Did you know this was coming? The foreman nodded, hiding his own amazement much more successfully. Sure, he'd signed off of the mis on the mysterious paperwork sent over by the corporate in response to his latest or last requisition, something about an, an American program. More red tape from Canberra was nothing new. But this marvelous contraption was absolutely new, and as the excavator's claws roared to life and ripped into its face, doing it in an instant what would have taken their old machines two hours, he joined his miners in his raucous yell. Thank God for the Americans. Cool. Oh, oh crap. Their GDP in factories will increase while our GDP decreases. Oh crud. Oh no, I didn't realize that. Uh, 503. Oh, we lost five billion in GDP. Well, you know, it's, honestly, that's kind of fine. Our deficit to income ratio is pretty good. The terms of a deal. The Japanese delegation has put forward the proposal of the resumption of trade between our economies. While the terms they set forth to end the embargo seem fairly agreeable, they've also decided to tie the issue to that of the treaty ports. They demand that we pay a hefty sum of money for the return of their ports, and have made a deal on the transfer of condition of the resumption of trade. While placing this condition on what could have been a straightforward subject to resolve that has outraged most of our delegation, with many calling for an immediate end to negotiations, cooler heads point out that access to the vast Asian markets is a prize well worth the cost. At the very least, we should attempt to separate the issues and offer condition free resumption of trade, which your responsibility will pay the ports if it makes them happy. Trade will resume without conditions or not at all. Smiles all around. Hmm. I don't know. We'll pay for the ports. You know what? We got enough money. We'll see what happens. The dance partner here in Stonewall Inn, the dances are many. Dances profane and holy, intimate and vast, moneyed and poor alike. For now, it's all John Russo can keep up with one. Left and right, and right and left, again, a swirl of the body so sweeping it belongs on the parade square, not on the rough tiles of the inn floor. Then the shoes opposite him tra trace the contours and the leaf slips and end up in their original placing by some arcane coincidence. Martin glares at him with visible annoyance. John looks down in sheepishness. The moment stretches taut, pulls apart, and snaps. Martin bursts out laughing, tickled by something on John's face, and pulls him, so pulls him to himself. His face smells of smoke and aftershave. The kiss is tart and startling in the dim neon. John pulls back with the old instincts of the Brooklyn boy who always knew how much of himself to show and how much to hide. Ooh, I hope he's not showing too much. But today, a part of him resists, and instead he stays. It's a raw comfort, and in the glittering sharpness of the moment, it's, it's all he has. Martin pulls away with some reluctance. The day has been brief, and even this hour has been snatched at great cost. They haven't much time. He takes John's arm together. They spin out of the little bar, their little dance studio. Their figures are quickly lost in the chaos and brilliance of the New York light, uh, New York night, blending in neon-shaded phantoms just before disappearing. How romantic. That's only 67, so... I'm really interested in disco, man. Give me some disco. Hopefully they listen to it. Smiles all around. Cool. It would appear... It 
An end is in sight for the trade embargo between the world's greatest economies. Lead negotiators from the ongoing summit between Japan and the U.S. have made an announcement this morning that a deal will be resuming trade between their countries that, that, that has been agreed in principle to be later signed today. On both sides of the Pacific, great hopes are being placed on the economic benefits of the deal, and businesses are scrambling to take advantage of the new goods and markets and offer. It seems the world is one step closer, closer to thawing in relations between the U.S. and Japan. Let's hope the goods flow across the Pacific. Let's hope so. The third clause now. It's time to move on to the third and last issue, the treaty ports. It's obvious to everyone that no real approachment between our nations is possible while the Japanese occupy parts of the American mainland with all the threats that they had imply, and the Japanese have indicated their willingness to return to the ports. The specifics of the transfer has been left up to the end of the negotiations, and this will be the last clause up for a discussion. We have a few options for how we position ourselves to approach these final negotiations. Our advisors fear that a straightforward transfer will be perceived in Japan as a loss of face, and that the politics of that perception might jeopardize negotiations. To avoid this, they say, we should offer to demilitarize the ports under the pond transfer. By doing so, we will ensure the Japanese have something they can point to as getting in return, enabling them to transfer the ports without appearing weak. Others in our administration counsel a tougher approach. The goal of the whole summit, they say, is to return a page on relations with the Japanese, and that it can only be accomplished if they agree not to only transfer the port, but to demilitarize Hawaii. With the Hawaiian missile crisis in all too recent memory, they claim that asymmetry of mutual threat will soon cause a rise in tensions back to the previous levels as long as the Japanese garrison the, I garrison the island chain. Our most hawkish counsel suggests that we can demand the demilitarization of Hawaii while they're offering to demilitarize the ports in return. According to them, it's the only solution the man in the street will accept, and that's the only way to prevent future resentment from souring relations. What approach should we choose? Ooh, we can demand the demilitarization of Hawaii without offering to demilitarize the terms. You know, allow demilitarization, free ports, and demilitarize islands with secure relations. Hmm. Oh man. So this might mean we might play hardball, and I might have to fade in, fade out because of what we do here. I did pay them. I did pay them extra money, so that's true. D free ports and demilitarized islands. Hmm. Demand or demilitarize Hawaii before we receive our ports. I'm gonna do that one. We'll see what happens. Cause hey, we paid you. We gave you all that fuel. So like, just work with us, guys. And do you really want to garrison Hawaii? Do you really want to garrison Hawaii? They actually might really want to do that. <laughs> Maybe. 67. We're getting that one done, which is great. So we're done with our air doctrine. We're working on our naval doctrine. I think we're doing pretty well. We're also doing that one too. Battleships. We can make more battleships and resume battleship of development. Eh, that's kind of okay. That stuff is okay. Just in case. I'm going to go and do remove critical hit or 10% lower chance to receive critical hits. Just in case. You never know. Come on, Japan. Give in, give in, give in. I've given you enough. Give me... Actually, you know what? Let's trade away for those chromium pieces. You know what? Japan, you want to trade? Come on, let's trade them. Actually, is that... Is that... Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we're trading. Come on. Come on. The Japanese response. Our request for demilitarization of Hawaii has apparently not been well received in the Japanese camp. Finally refusing to consider the merits of our proposal, they say that the port transfer is the only issue up for the discussion. Demilitarization is not is only a part of these talks as a condition for the port transfer, they say, and insists equally firmly on the condition and the complete impossibility of reciprocation. The Hawaiian Missile Crisis, they remind us, was caused by American recalcitrance and our internal failures driving foreign policy decisions that the onus is entirely on the U.S. to prevent a repeat of the event. Many in our administration point out that this arrogance is typical of the Japanese in their dealings with us. Discussions are completed on the clauses that matter to the Japanese, so they are reverted to their attitude of victorious conquerors, dictating demands to a vanquished foe. If we accept their diktats, they'll say we will set up for them to continue their arrogant disregard for our interests in the future dealings as well. On the other hand, the success of this summit hinges on us finding some ways to accommodate both nations here, and we might need to give them this to prevent the negotiations from unraveling entirely. However, we reply, we, there will be no room for further negotiations on the issue. How should we do it? Only the ports will be demilitarized. We will insist on a civilian Hawaii. Because apparently like we can trade like Panama or something. Or maybe we demilitarize Panama. Maybe. I, that's what, at least that's what I looked up before I started recording this specific episode. Because I, because I'll be honest, like, before every episode, I usually, I like 500 billion, uh, remind myself about how to do things and how to do things correctly. So our northern brothers, oh, I don't want to hurt my GDP. Factories of Sydney. Actually, you know what? Let's not do that one. Even though we're really focused on foreign policy, I'm going to go ahead and do one of these. Un-American institutions. The FBI, the CIA, the National Security 
agency or NSA. In theory, these agencies comprise the arm of America's law dedicated to shield the country and its citizens from threats both foreign and domestic. In theory, this triad and a plethora of others are the eyes in the dark which watch over America while she sleeps, a protective gaze that gives much but asks for little and whose honest, dutiful, and law-abiding work is its own reward. Never before has practice diverged from theory more distantly than the alphabet soup agencies that form the so-called cult of intelligence. In their zeal to protect America from threats both real and imagined, they've trampled upon the rights of the very citizens which form America's body politic. For the good of the country, something must be done to rein them in. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh, they, oh, we have 100 invested, and they have 45. Oh, we, we are definitely investing a lot. Air Department. Das Kong Kunderreich Caucus and Declare Warren. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, cool. Have fun, guys. Greek Caucus Revolt. Oh, crap. Tra low trade. That's not good. Come, what? Japan. Japan. Oh, uh, look. Cuba's not with us. I'm going to do this with, uh, you guys. Cuba, would you? You're commies, aren't you? You live by Castro. Yeah, there you are. Oh. That cigar, not bad. It looks kind of painted on, maybe, but... It's going to be kind of uncomfortable smoking like that. It looks like it's coming almost straight from the center of his mouth all the way to, like, a 90-degree angle out of his mouth. So, round two. Oh, boy. Not days after the riotous celebrations in L.A. and San Francisco, the foreign minister returned to Washington, D.C. under President Kennedy's personal in invitation. The visit's official intent was a tour around the American capital, a show of goodwill capitalizing on the momentum of the now-named handover's success. Wait, do we have it back? Hold on. American troops may not enter, but... Oh, yeah. So, unofficially, well, the old man had his suspicions. He thought them confirmed when he entered the Oval Office and saw the President. Tur back turned, inspecting a large canvas of the map of Hawaii. The Minister drew in a sharp breath as he took a seat, sealing himself for the last conversation he ever wished to confront in his con career. Uh, just like accom accommodations are here to your liking, President Kennedy asked without glancing back. The Foreign Minister grunted in assent. Not exactly proper decorum, but he figured the science meant the President didn't care. Good. Leather shoes clacked with polished lint linoleum as the president shoveled back to the resolute desk putting forward several folders out of its cabinet he spread the stack across the surface like a dealer with a stack of cards each folder bore proposal and read capital letters across the tab wouldn't you want wouldn't want to keep you from seeing the site so i'll keep this brief we've got some ideas for government's consideration we'll discuss these more during your stay as quickly as he had arrived the minister left the office escorted by his assigned guide when he eventually respected the president's ideas in printed form he was drawn the most to Ooh, heard your message Exchanging the Panama, Panama Canal Zone for Hawaii. Unconditional retrocession of the Hawaiian Islands to its rival government. Measure negotiations. Ooh. Canal Zone. I don't want to give them that. I don't mind spending more political power, honestly. Regarding DMZ enforcement. Measure negotiations. We'll do urgent message. Let's try that one. Because we're still spending more political power anyways. As much as I'd love to choose Wade, I don't like minus 10%, so we'll get Jane. Just because we already have two Marys. A Mary, Mary Jane. And then this other guy we have. They've invested 50, we've invested 75. Oh, wait, that actually lowered our stuff. Whoops, that's not good. The Eagle withdraws. The handover sparked hope that the brinkmanship that nearly ended the world will, unlike, will end unlike the way it began. Relations between the Japanese Empire and the U.S. were warmer than they ever had been in decades. So much that the proposals to share the world's largest ocean between them were openly advanced, rather than dismissed without hesitance. As the two superpowers met again to discuss exactly that, many thought they would see the Pacific question settled within their lifetimes. Such fantasies were dispelled by American diplomats, leaving the conference disgruntled and without the promised settlement. The Eagle had long clawed for the land's shore and off its dominion. It was arguably proper for Washington to demand their, re their return. Nevertheless, the writing Sing Sun only saw and propriety and arrogance in American sanctions had it not, after all, returned two ports to the rightful owner already, the Eagle must be content with what it had won. Japan reapproached, lest it suffer poor Icarus's fate in the skyward climb. But did right and matter and wrong matter to the millions of who longed for peace in that state rather than the conflict that kept frozen until it can't? Oh, I must have failed. So, I will be right back. Alright, my friends, so we are back. And, uh, I'll be honest, I've tried this literally four or five times off screen. Or maybe trying to record and didn't go well. But we're going to go ahead and choose the middle one, the Panama Canal Zone for Hawaii. We'll see what happens, because I've done actually done this path, uh, but it's still gone right once when I tried it off screen, and it's gone incorrectly once when I was doing it at, while recording. So, the counter offer, they want Panama. I'm kind of tired of reading all this. If you would like to read about this, go right ahead. They basically want Panama, and we're trying to figure out what to do. Tell Tokyo Americans know when they're being conned. Tell Tokyo that we're keeping Panama, but without our men, on, men from here on. Tell Tokyo they have a deal. 
Well, if you want to read about the Go Right Ahead, just because I've already read this once or twice, and I don't want to read it like three times for my own personal benefit, but that's basically what it's about. Panama. So what we're going to do, we're keeping Panama, but we're going to demilitarize it. So hopefully they'll accept. Hopefully we do have a half a billion again. Half a trillion, I mean, in terms of GDP, which is nice. But come on, come on, Japan. Un-American institutions. Cool. And we shall do this one next. The Docks of Darwin. Our first step in escalating our military aid programs for the Australasian region would be to help fortify and expand the port of Darwin, an important base for the U.S. Navy and our primary unloading point for equipment and vehicles going to the Australians. We cannot leave vulnerable to the Japanese. Very good. Come on, come on, come on. The many heads of the Hydra. Okay, so I'm, we'll read this a little later because I want to get through this as fast as possible just because I'm kind of tired of... Uh, doing the same thing over and over again. So, the next obstacle the conference would hurdle was how violations should be addressed. The Japanese delegation demanded that emphasize all parties are bound by the agreement's terms ensuring or ensuring such required appropriate retribution in the event of that either party, irrespective of a reason, fails to uphold the said terms. Laws are toothless without punishments of the Japanese foreign minister, and only sharp teeth suffice for treaties between two nations that can end the world with a single button press. Our ambassadors were split on the issue. On one hand, clearly defined punishments for violations within the proposed DMZs dis disincentivize Japan from using them as a de facto outpost for the Pacific-wide cord on Santerre, provided, of course, that the same penalties apply to them. Those inclined to trust the Empire's intentions argue that the punishments will be seductively and aggressively applied at our disfavor. Additionally, a minority of pine, stringent punishments will prevent us from justifying certain actions or activities through creative interpretation of the agreement's terms. Future administrations may find themselves in option short should they need the, for action and the DMZs arise, and the American delegation approved disciplinary measures for violating the agreement. Uh, cool. Let's try that one. And I'll read this one if... if this is successful. Because I have seen it successful by doing this exact uh, path of stuff. Everyone read about the many heads of the Hydra go right ahead. But, uh... We, got, we still have ten days, so... The Man of the Iron Fortress will read that too. The Handshake. Okay, okay, here we go. The Handshake. The Secretary's high sigh... Oh, the Secretary's sigh honed on the outstretched hand, coarse, wrinkled, and about the size of a at closer squint. A small band that glowed dull against the fluorescent lamps wrung around its fourth finger. Less ornaments than his own, maybe several years more worn, but a wedding finger all the same. A wedding ring, really. He glanced at the conference room, or what was a conference room. Shredded and whole paper covered every square inch of floorboard, topped by stray mug shards slick with drying pools of coffee and the straying stray blood smear. Its occupants fared a little better. Either they were dozing off where they stood or sat or laid, wincing at cuts or bruises covered in flimsy gauze pads or both. Twenty-four straight hours of wheeling and dealing a treaty had taken its toll. No doubt the Japanese were eager to leave with what they had. At least then they'll enjoy sleeping in cushions and far more than a few hours in the flight home. Can he say the same for his? That they were satisfied with what they had? Will his countrymen approve of what he'd wrangled from the Empire when all said and done? Or will both dig their heels and ask for more? The secretary then turned to the man with the outstretched hand, opposite his side of the long table. Stodgy with a bald spot, purple bags for eyes, a rotund belly protruding from an unbuttoned suit. He might as well have been a middle-aged salaryman coming home from overtime, rather than the Empire's premier representative abroad. Yet his tired smile and open palm seemed to offer a hope just as mundane. Peace from across the table. The first in a very long time, nodding to himself, the secretary of state, cleared his throat, Mr. Pritis, Mr. Minister, we regret to... No, we're not going to do that one. That'd be nuts. I've done this five times off screen. Clasp the hand firm with his own and shook. Cool. And time for the many heads of the Hydra. The prevailing winds of American politics blow in the direction of progressivism, but not all those in government are prepared to join the prison's righteous crusade against injustice. Plenty of ancient toads from less enlightened administrations populate America's labyrinthine institutions, slagging off their new boss while also never failing to collect their paycheck every week. It's about time our enemies in government learn not to bite the hand that feeds them. They're planning to go after, but Hoover and his FBI stand out as the first unruly mutt to be brought to heel. No matter the cost, all traces of reactionary dissent must be purged from the government, so that nothing and no one stands in the way of justice for all Americans. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Cool. Also, in between the, uh, what was it? The black screen fading out, fading in? I got some coffee here, too, so... An ocean pacified. The Pacific Ocean was hardly Pacific even before the Second World War. Great powers that in the past had offered at least a stick of kindling to the heart or hearth fires below the large cauldron, soaking its waters to an even simmer. Not too hot that it reaches that its riches cannot be plumbed, nor too mild that all may freely sate their greed with them. This delicate, almost gentlemanly balance was shattered when the world bared witness to a boiling seas and a sunset stronger than the daylight sun. As mushroom clouds ended one age and announced the next, many feared the Pacific will forever stay between twilight and Armageddon, kept in place by two ambitions greater than the expanse of which they both contest. Such fears were laid to rest today by a pair of disheveled or disheveled ambassadors, all but bracing each other's 
an vervent awaits as they hobbled out of a hotel lobby. Against camera flashes and microphones, a hand each lifted paper bearing two signatures from the government of the two great nations. Murmured speculation diffused throughout the gathered press before the wary secretary sip pried open the foreign minister's sake bottle with bare teeth, dropped half its vigor, and let loose an empathetic prophetic cry. Peace in our time. Woo, we did it. Man, that took me like 20 minutes off screen to do that, actually to finally get that done. Woo. Atsu 2 changes to Patton Islands. Oh, yes. Oh, there we go. Oh, yes, 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 yes. It's, it has to be demilitarized. I, that's fine with me. I don't... Actually... Wait, do these have to be demilitarized? Because Panama's now demilitarized. Yeah, Panama's demilitarized. Which is fine with me. I don't really care. But is this demilitarized, though? Maybe not. Hold on. Hey, we got... Hey, they're MPP. They're center... I mean, I guess that makes sense. They would probably support us and getting them back home. Hey, look at that. Very nice. Actually, if we let a day go by, does this reset? Like... That's... 34, 68, uh, I don't think these numbers are adding up. That's okay, The Man in the Iron Fortress. Science fiction author Philip K. Dick has released this novel named The Man in the Iron Fortress, a work of speculative alternate history. The novel takes place in a dystopian world where communism reigns supreme. The point of divergence in the story's history is that the socialist politician Eugene Debs remained with the Democrats, becoming president in 1920. As a result, he supported the nascent Soviet Union and the May 4th movement in China. Debs believed died with him in 26, and his successor Robert La Follette proved to be far more isolationist and a trend that dominated American politics for the next 20 years. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union became dominated by the authoritarian Felix Zerzinski, while the communists under Mao Zedong were able to unite China and counter-invade the Japanese. When the Nazis rose to power, they were able to crush unsupported allied nations of Europe, but were unprepared for a surprise Soviet invasion and were swiftly defeated. In 47, a joint sign of Soviet army invaded America, leading to them dividing the country north and south, which is kind of interesting that we div be divided that way, but it makes sense. The novel set within occupied America and follows a wide cast of characters from a chick a spy to a Chinese official obsessed with American cowboy culture. At the center of its plot was a book called The Beast Among the Reeds, which shows of a world where both Nazism and communism were defeated. The political backdrop is a rapidly of decaying Soviet Sino relations. Uh, Zerzinski is succeeded after his death by even more totalitarian Lavrenti Beria, and the threat of nuclear war looms on the horizon. Despite the novel's criticism for seemingly unrealistic developments, the Soviets allegedly drained the Baltic Sea for farmland and built a giant bridge stretching from the Bering Strait between Russia and Alaska. Dick has defended the action as being plausible within the best available information he could acquire at the time. That still hasn't stopped the book from becoming a bestseller in the U.S. and Canada, as it's already become nominated for a Hugo Award. What? Is regular history being too boring for readers now? So when are we going to get the TNO spin-off sub-mod, or just mod in general, for Man in the Iron Fortress, please? Yes? Oh, carriers, nice. U.S.-Japanese treaty signed. The winds change in the Pacific. Hopefully, we get access to all the goods here, too. I want to trade. Trade, 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 trade. So it's 68. Happy 1968. I told you that hopefully, or I maybe mentioned, that hopefully this will be a great year for everyone. And hopefully it will be. Gunship range. Attack up. Oh, yeah, that's good. Imper improved aerial refueling. Yeah, please. Got plenty of political power. Political coal landscape. anti guerrilla activities. Great, great, great. We finally got through that. Ooh, that took a while. Oh, 414, not bad. We got our ports back. We also got Hawaii back. We're going to build up Kansas. Not bad, but time to ruin everything with decisions so we can get a Republican Democrat elected uh, from Ohio, maybe, for the next election. The Dr. Darwin. I would say RFK's, at least after we say it's coming a little bit, uh, his foreign policy, pretty darn good. But we got to do... Examine the police force. To serve and protect, so goes the refrain. Ideally, the dual matters of who to serve and who to protect should not be addressed. The equality of service and protection is a sin quo non for a government agency. To our shame, America's officers have taken advantage of the model's good faith to display selective selectivity, supposed to say in its implementation. The prejudices of our police force presents not merely a moral quandary and any good man should overcome, but a scattering of thorns deeply embedded within the body politic, sending shooting pains throughout the country as it attempts to grow freely. An examination is long overdue, and like any good doctor, we must adhere to our oaths and do our best to root out these thorns. Well, let's see what happens. Hey, minus 24 billion, not bad. Ah, not bad. Uh, you know what? I'm still going to keep boosting the budget. It's only 6 billion more. That's fine. Construction budget, it's, it's pretty small already. Civilian spending, we could probably lower it, but man, we're kind of good for now. Keep building up factories and radar and our allies, really. But first, build up Hawaii. Because we can. They come back home to us, and we will reward them. Empire of Japan, do we, do we get anything else here? I thought we got, like, Patton Island or something. Oh, uh, that's Japanese island. Oh, how about over here? Oh, that's still technically part of Hawaii. That's fine. You know what? Build some radar here, too. 
and the presidential election has begun. Uh, I'm not going to read about the Senate class three elections because it happens every time. Because unfortunately, keep America strong and free. Vote R and D. Cool. All right. So the MPP is going to do very well, unfortunately, so far. So, oh god, I hope I can do this. It's only February first. So we got to make some major mistakes here. Some major, 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 major mistakes. Uh, it doesn't matter where we start. Strong lead all over the West Coast. Oh, man. They're pretty strong everywhere. I'm going to go ahead and do the Great Plains because we can. Cool. The presidential election season has begun. The primaries are concluded. The convention is now over. And now the battle between the chosen candidates of the Republican Democrats and the National Progressive Party will begin in earnest. While every electoral race from the county commissioners to state judges to the Senate in Washington is important, none of them can compare to the drama, pageantry, and scale of a presidential race that has spans the whole country. Unlike many nations in the world where leaders are determined behind closed doors or in bloody coups and civil wars, every four years the citizens of America get to change the course of their nation in a peaceful transition that goes right back to Washington, George, George Washington in 1789. Many important issues of the day will be debated from taxes to foreign policy, uh, from infrastructure to welfare. But more and more, the personality of the candidates is what's important. Who's the charmer? Who's more charismatic? Who's the one who makes the voter truly feel that they can hear them? And who will fight for them? The polls, televised debates, newspaper interviews, and speeches around the nation will help keep help the undecided make their choice while reinforcing the parties the partisans in theirs. The race has begun. Awesome. It's a long way to November. Let's see, upcoming race, yeah. Oh goodness. Maybe getting Hawaii back might not have been a good idea for that, but whatever. So American society is disunited, that's good. So that's that's still good. Different schools. F oh, wait. So it's... Okay, so also, what I remember, if you get to this point in February 68, the chance of RFK getting assassinated just drops immediately from what I understand. So we're good without getting him assassinated for now. If he gets re-elected, of course, he'll probably get, you know, destroyed, but that's that's later. That's later. So, it looks like we should probably... Hmm, be seen more as a liberal candidate, maybe. Let's campaign for civil rights. Divide the party. In 12 days, is ready for anything for the MPP. Uh, let's see. Ooh, what, what happened there? The other department, cool. Let's go and grab that. Air department, cool. And another person, great. Can we grab another one? No? Okay, maybe not. Uh, okay, we'll get, do it like that. Hamilton, I will choose you because, well, I can't really select anyone else, so. Some of the police force. Top of the hardliners goes further divided. Radical support base. I, I really want to divide everything here now. Oh, a fan with the English are already with us. Rally the center. Yeah, this stuff. We don't really diplomatic arena. The road towards justice is probably the best thing we could do. Political landscape. We gotta have. Yeah, I, I've got to smash the unity here for the MPP. Hey, 503 billion. Not bad though. 76 billion in terms of national debt. So good. Global fleet distribution. Just in case, let's keep focusing on our navy a little bit more. Uh, the hidden arm. Yes, please. Examine the police force. And next, watching the watchman. Rain Hoover in. Every politico in the Beltway, from lowly staffers to the beloved presidents, learn to watch their backs from J. Edgar Hoover. The FBI's infamous director, Hoover, Hoover has led the means, or has the means and the will to acquire every single skeleton in an unlikely man's closet. Those unfortunate enough to have gained his ire or refused his wants will see their careers brought to an end ignominious and by scandalous bomb chills leaked to the press by concerned citizens, such as the chilling terror of who may consider the kingmaker of D.C. President Kennedy cannot be cowed so easily, however. Untouchable he may be, but the director has just as many skeletons as any old statesman. With proper planning and the right people, we may be able to catch him with his own trap. Getting arguably America's greatest spy man on our side as a stable weapon will be a great boon for the longevity of the president's agenda despite the risks involved. Oh boy. Voting together. MPP far right, left and center are voting together. Uh, that's cool. Those who work forces. Uh, despite pledging to serve and protect every American citizen, it's an open secret that racism taints the police departments of America like black mold and old plaster. Unfortunately, a career in the police appears to attract the kind of people who have aggressive views and enjoy using the power to beat down people they don't like and anyone who looks at them sideways while they do it. And the tested approval from the brass doesn't help matters. Every week, more reports come in of black people being harassed, wrongfully arrested, beaten, and yes, killed by the policemen in cities all across the nation. This epidemic of racist violence against American citizens by the men who are paid to protect them must be stopped. This morning, President Kennedy gave a speech at Capitol Hill, virtually denouncing the systematic racism of law enforcement and promising to root out the un-American racists entrenched within the nation's police. Thurman responded by calling the president a witch hunter in the Senate, but we can't let this cra craggy old lizards in Washington stop us. We will stop this injustice of whatever it takes. Another system to be fixed. Oh, well, that was fast. That was actually really fast. Cool. 
Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Let's get some better artillery. Because, good god, I love artillery. Things go boom. Make me happy. Well, that sounds kind of weird out of context. Don't take that out of context, please. But I do love this coffee. Pretty good. Uh, I'm still going to fix some other stuff. I'm making some ships. We need some more jet casts. Cool. Anything else increased by unity? Nope. How's this looking? MPP has a strong lead in all sorts of different places. That's not good. Uh, or do we normally get told how we do it with our campaign? Or no? Okay. Let's close that one up. The road towards justice. Campaign with Wallace. Let's no campaign where we haven't. The center goes more popular. East Southern Fears. No. Hardline supporters. He gained support. I don't want him to gain support, but the National Progressive Party. Honestly, I don't think it's worth doing just because for this, when you see this, they're ready for anything. That's just for legislation. Right now, we don't need that since we're trying to run an election. So that probably wouldn't be ideal to do right now. But America's looking pretty good. A lot of factories, too. Love it. Less than $75 billion in terms of national debt. So good. Just, mmm. Because where we're going, hopefully, we're going to be spending a lot of money. We're going to be spending a lot, a lot of money. Cool. We let them in and throw an investigation. Miraculously, Hoover has agreed to cooperate with the Kennedy administration. There remains a bevy of work to do before we can rest on our laurels, however. For now, we can put our ally to good use. Since the day we lost the Second World War, support for the fascist menace has unfortunately risen in our own shores. This has led to the upswing in membership with the groups such as the KKK and the formation of movements which share the same viewpoints. They are a menace on not only the black populations of the South, in which they have both a large presence and widespread widespread support, but also on the lawmen who attempt to enforce our laws. In short, fascist paramilitaries are running around the South, causing havoc for the government and its people. But if there is anyone who can find all sorts of excuses to bring down them for good, it's Mr. Speed himself. Cool. Uh, what is Borman up to? Because he won. T troll under the bridge. Oh. No, he's not much up to anything. Okay. Nobody said that reforming the nation would be easy, but it's been a whole lot less painful if our own employees weren't actively scheming against us. Using the FBI as his own personal army of spies, Hoover has become one of the most powerful and feared men in the country, covertly infiltrating government organizations all across America, allegedly amassing a huge quantity of blackmailed material, and carrying out clandestine and often, often illegal operations. In essence, there is a shadow government within the government, infesting our institutions like dormant tuberculosis bacteria, just waiting for the conditions to be right to be for them to awaken. This has to stop. Though he should be our uh, obedient underling, Hoover has effectively become a rogue spy master with an unprecedented level of power and clout, and his interests are very often at times at odds with our own. He's far too entrenched in the FBI to be effectively neutralized, but perhaps we can give him a bit of his own medicine to get a leash on him and stop his unethical operations. There have been unseemingly rumors about Hoover and his longtime protege, Clyde Tolson, floating about around for decades, involving all male parties and furtive visits from handsome young men in the middle of the night. Hoover may like dirty tricks, but the two can play at the game. Let's fling his closet open and see what skeletons fall up. Everyone must be brought to heel. Oh boy. All male parties. That sounds kind of like a sausage party to me, but hmm. Regardless, this cop is pretty good. Let's see, a friend of Dorothy. Men of Hoover's wealth status have long graduated past the furtive boy on boy touching of the school board bedroom and the shame should I groping in public restrooms and carry on their own clandestine affairs in luxury hotel rooms. Ooh. It was all. It was in one such plush, well appointed hotel that one of our Secret Service agents was able to snap a few choice photographs of Hoover staying there with his protege of several decades and second in command, Tolson, in a room which, with only one bed. Even more interestingly, we got some pictures of Hoover and Tolson meeting with a pair of handsome young men in the hotel bar and taking them up to the room. All you have to do is a little bit of digging and all of a sudden you're turning up yellow old skeletons all over the place. Dig up the yellow brick road and you know, who knows what you'll find. That's kind of, uh, kind of sus. But whatever, you know. Okay. Not much I can do about that right now. Ooh, Takaki. Beginning of the second phase. I kind of hope they invade Japan once they're done. Oh, a coalition of equals. Authoritarian democracy. I still got to play as Japan, though. But I don't know if they can actually go to war with China at the time of this recording. I kind of hope they can. Ooh. On our own. Pulls updated. Cool. Let's check on the horse race. Uh, Takaki's equals. That's kind of cool. Coalition. Dealing with others. Cool. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm probably going to do this a little bit off-screen just to make sure that we can win with the way I want to go. Or that we really want to go for, uh... <clears throat> the stars, we'll say. Advanced drop tanks? Cool. Let's grab that. That'd be good. Can I do this yet? Can I campaign? Why can't I campaign? 
I mean, I guess it's only April 4th, so that makes sense why we can't campaign yet, but still. Actually, what do we have for the road towards justice? Well, exporters. Goes further divided. Civil rights. Yeah, meh. The death of Antonio de Oliveria Salazar. Big sadness. Big sad. Big, big sad. Campaign with Wallace. Nope. Mm, nope. Mm, nope. And nope. Industrial espionage. Don't mind if we do. Modernize the department. We've already done that, I guess. Cool. Actually, Turkey has quite a bit of territory. We even have Western Thrace. Wow. That'd be kind of cool if they could colonize that area, though. Slowly colonize uh, other areas. That'd be kind of cool. Oh, Israel's still here. That's cool. Israel, what are you up to? Led by Mr. Begin. Okay. A most thorough investigation. War on poverty, build a safety net, consult with king, uproot justice, erase his prison system, uh, set the reading, integration, and the good life, and suburbs in the things, wounds. Is that? Oh, yeah, cool. Take as many as many brown versus boards as it takes. Watching the Watchmen. As part of the country's finely tuned system of checks and balances, America's venerable constitution has granted the president the power to create new agencies and commissions without consulting Congress on the matter. Often these organizations, benefiting the ad hoc nature of their creation, tackle single issues with the resources they are apportioned. President Kennedy has seen it fit to form such one such commission by executive order. The National Ethics Commission missions bears a simplicity that makes masks its significance. To ensure that the government enforces the law to both its letter and spirit. In, just, in a just world, the president can trust his subordinates across the country to uphold their oaths. For an especially unjust world, he remarks, the NEC is a necessity in order to protect the march of progress. And we'll probably get an event regarding Hoover or something like that. A change in the air. Since we put a leash on Hoover, our agents have been steadily tearing through the FBI's files to exactly figure out what they've been up to. And surprise, surprise, it's not sunshine and rainbows. From the records that remain, it appears that Hoover has been using the FBI as his own personal army, sending agents to acquire blackmail material on important figures and extra judiciary judicially pursuing suspected criminals. Among the less shocking stuff in a number of redacted files, our agents have uncovered evidence of a secret program called Co-Intel Pro. Ooh! Well, we don't have all the facts so far, but it appears to be an intelligence gathering program focused on somewhat vaguely chosen enemies of the nation, most notable civil rights leaders. Hoover apparently authorized the use of illegal tactics to gather information on these people and harass them into silence and inaction. Needless to say, this is a complete and total violation of the victim's rights and a subversion of everything President Kennedy stands for. It's time to drag Hoover into the Oval Office and have a rather serious chat with him. The cat's out of the bag. Ooh, and I wonder if we could use this for our own personal gain. I wonder. To answer violence with violence. The air sat still and muggy in the Roosevelt room. Many of the men sitting around the table had rolled up their sleeves and loosened their ties. Kennedy's chair creaked back as he looked back. I looked at each of them in turn. Hoover, Humphrey, key members of his cabinet. He turned to the aides, clustered around the wall, and asked him to leave. When he was alone with his most trusted underlings, as well as Hoover, he began. Mr. Hoover, so far we've discussed the principles and functions of the Co-Intel Pro program. And for now, I'm letting you off the hook. The president had hoped Hoover would be would visibly show relief, but he just sat there blankly like an Olmec head. However, it strikes me that it would be a colossal waste of resources to simply cancel the program. That got some odd looks from Humphrey and the others. Hoover narrowed his eyes in appraisal. Kennedy continued, It has occurred to me that with minimal difficulty, this program could be repurposed to investigate <clears throat> certain reactionary elements that oppose the goals and ideals of this administration, including the enemies of justice within the party. Everyone in the room looked taken aback. Humphrey stared at the president, open mouthed in surprise. Internally furious, Kennedy hadn't consulted him beforehand. How Hoover, however Hoover, after a moment of inaction, smiled knowingly. Of course, Mr. President. Why would it? It would hardly take any time at all. All you've got to do is write me a list. His toad-like grin stretched out from every wrinkle. Kennedy nodded blankly. Very good, Mr. Hoover. We'll be in touch soon. Thank you, everyone. Extreme problems require extreme solutions. Oh boy. Oh no. What's going to happen? Oh no. <laughs> oh man, this is this is gonna fun. I love it when things start falling apart. Oh well, not when they fall apart under my watch, you know. Oh, if things fall apart under my watch, I get pissed off. But that's okay. That's okay. Uh, I want I want to see what happens next. Uh, almost seventy billion, almost less than seventy billion. We can't campaign yet. Oh man, with Hoover there, man. Was Hoover like that in real life? I have no idea. I've only heard of him. Oh wait. Oh, here we go. The co. Oh, not COINTEL, it's COINTEL program? While used originally to investigate leaders and organizations involved with the civil rights movement, the President Kennedy has repurposed the FBI's co 
Contel Pro program to investigate political opponents and to oppose the very progress that is needed for the nation to survive. While opposed by some in the cabinet, it will ensure that we can force anyone who disagrees with their progress to see the light. It's recommended that these, we use these activities that are not taken lightly, too, as this could lead to the wrong people getting upset. Infiltrate the Yaquis? Infiltrate the John Birch Society. Cool. Uh, we'll do the Yaquis first, but I think that's going to end today's camp. Pain today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. It was quite uh, the toss up trying to get back Hawaii, demilitarize Panama, and get our ports back. I think we did really well, and we're probably going to leave RFK's legacy kind of into a mixed bag. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we're going to make a couple decisions and maybe have a new president. Maybe, maybe not. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.